Let us pray. Father, as we have gathered here this morning, we thank you that we can do so. As we open our hearts and our lives to you, send that love from above. Fill our hearts with your love. May we sense your spirit uh, this morning that we'll be drawn closer to you and to one another. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. It's everywhere, but you can't buy it. You can't sell it. You can give it. You can receive it. It can make you warm. You can feel cold when you don't have it. It's as real as the air you breathe. It sustains you. It makes you feel secure. When you don't have it, you feel lonely, lost, confused, and broken. It's as real as the electricity that travels across uh, electric lines, but you can't hold it in your hand. It's so simple. It's a child's smile. It's a dog's tail that wags every time when you're in its presence. It's a simple touch, a kind word, a thoughtful remembrance. Love is so very simple, isn't it? The songwriter of old has written, all you really need is love. And you can say those five words over and over and over again, and you hardly get tired of it, because you can never receive enough of it. But love, as simple as it is, is so complex and confusing, for you see that simple love turns to complexity when it's a matter of who gets the last piece of the pie. Who goes first? Who decides? Who drives? Why is it going to be this way rather than my way? Why do I feel so unloved when I give so much love? We often use the word love as a describer of so many different things. We, we say we love our children, we say we love our spouses, but then again we say we love pumpkin pie, and we love the car going down the street. We wish we had one just like it. And I love that dress you just bought, dear. It matches the other three in your closet so well. And those new tools, guys, that you just bought, your wife's going to say, I just love the fact that you had to buy those. It's such a small word, so overused and undervalued. And in so many ways, we can just begin to lift the corner of our understanding on it. But we'll do that today in hopes that as we do so, we'll come to the source of love that we might have a greater appreciation for it. I'm extremely humbled just even approaching the subject of love. In studying and reflecting as we've been going through the book of John, uh, the Gospel of John, we've been going through the I Am sayings, and it's a theology of Jesus proclaiming that he is divinity and humanity all in one package. But we're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to move from theology uh, to the, the subject of love. And I reflected in my mind, I've never preached a sermon on just the word love. It was too intimidating. 
because you can't ever do it justice. So I come humbly as a seeker after it in as much hope that I will receive it as you do today. Love. I'd invite you to uh, follow along in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. The first thing that I would note about love is that our source of love, that love comes from God. We, we say it so simply, but we want to look at the source of it, the security of it, and a few other factors. Then we're going to move to a few attributes and then a story. So the source of love. In John chapter 1, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, the admonition is beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For one who does not love does not know God, for God is what? God is love. It is the essence. Love is the essence. It is, a, it is the personification of the fullness of the triune God when you experience love. It's God working in your life, subtly, deeply, mildly. When somebody reaches out to you and you feel that love, it's the Holy Spirit communicating to you through another person directly when you experience that love. Have you felt it at times? Have you felt it? Some of you are with us, and some of you are not quite sure. Or maybe your love cup is full, and you're figuring, mine's full, I'll just wait for the overflow. Some of your love cups may be so empty that you're waiting to get the filling of that love cup. So, the first thing to note is that love... Um, Christ is the source of love. Love comes from God. By this love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this love, not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. The second, the second thing to note about God's love for us is the security of his love. It says that while we were yet sinners, he came seeking us. He came looking for us. It's a love that searches for us, never stops, 24 hours a day, looking for you, going, going looking for you at night, on the job, in the quietness, in the busyness, in the hecticness, it's His Holy Spirit coming alongside and saying, ever so quietly, sometimes breaking in ever so rudely, wait a minute, what did you just do? You better take a time out and pause, because what you did was not reflective of my character. Thank you, Lord. I'll step back. You can lead now for a while. And basking in His presence, calling us to be more like Him. But it is this God of love who doesn't wait for us to come to Him. But He sought us out first. That's the kind of God I love. That's the kind of God I serve. That's the kind of God that makes my heart weep. For when I turn away from Him and don't listen to Him and don't allow myself be, to be drawn into a closer relationship with Him, the security of His love is the invitation to come to Him again, to realize that He gave His only begotten Son, His only begotten Son while we were yet sinners on the cross, that we might have eternal life. What an amazing love. I don't know of a word that can fully describe that love. Do you? The largest, biggest word I could come up with is audacious. And even that just starts to scratch the surface. Perhaps it would be audacious, audacious, audacious love of God. Because we only begin to understand. Verse 10 says, that while, um, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 
No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And His love is perfected in us. It's an amazing thing that as we come to Christ, that His love abides in us. Then there's a sharing of that love. There is a searching, there is a security, and there's a sharing that He calls us to. Wouldn't you like to be in God's perfect love today? Wouldn't it be amazing? Wait a minute, wait a minute. With all of our technology, let's just go to the internet. Go to God's channel, click on it. Here comes the download. All right, welcome to God's channel. How are you doing in loving? Not so good, you type in. Well, go back and work on it a little bit. How are you doing on receiving my spirit? I'm trying. Very good. Go love somebody. How are you doing with loving somebody? Comes the response. I'm working on it, God. God replies back, My spirit abides with you, and if you are sharing my love, I am abiding in you, and my love is perfected in you. Isn't that what the Scripture says? My love is perfected in you. How many of you like to be perfect today? Come on, be honest. How many of you like to be perfect today? I would. Now, how many of you are perfect today? Now, now wait, I'll ask the person sitting next to you. Is the person sitting next to you per No, that's going someplace else. The Bible says, as we draw close to God and we share His love, His love is perfected in us to a tangible way to others and to the world. If I'm understanding Scripture clearly and plainly, love cannot be bottled up, love cannot be, sh love cannot be stored up, it has to be shared that those around us come under the influence of that love. So let me ask you, how is your love cup? Is it full? Do you have enough of it? Do you want more of it? You see, you can only store so much until the Spirit of God fills your life so much that it flows out to others. Now sometimes it's so empty that there's hardly anything to share. You've been there, haven't you? Sometimes you're so tired, sometimes you're so angry, sometimes you're so... Just a skew, there isn't anything that's going to come out of you, and the most loving thing you can do is take a time out. You know how that works? You've been around people that you'd like to say, the time out corner is waiting for you. Come back and talk to me in about 10 minutes after you abide with him for a while. But the scriptures, is, the scriptures are clear that we must share with others the love that Christ has given to us by abiding in Him, by testifying that Christ has given us His Spirit. Verse 15 says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him. And He in God, we've come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. God is love. And the one who abides in God, and God, abide in, 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 God abides in him. By this love, love is perfected in us. So it reiterates for a second time and says, perfect love casts out what? All fear. We love because he first loved us. If someone says in verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a what? He's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. I find that an interesting and striking uh, illustration of the subject of love. As we come down and as we look in 1 John chapter 4, you want to find out the temperature of your love? Find out how you're loving others. 
Don't pretend you love God if you can't love others. Others may make you, make you angry. Others may irritate you. Others may not agree with you. Others might be contrary. But isn't it the God of compassion, the God of mercy, that comes alongside them just as he comes alongside you? Isn't it the brother who's undergoing angst because of something you did that you just won't ask forgiveness for is the one perhaps that needs it the most. I know I've gone to meddling only because I've been there and I get there on a regular basis. So this is for me. If you want to listen in, please feel free to do so. It isn't until we love one another in the fullness that we, live God, we love God in the fullness. So if you want to look at how you're getting along in your relationship with God, look at how you're getting along in your relationship with others. Does it work that way? Am I telling the truth? Is this the gospel that comes from Christ himself? It's a big subject. But you can't have a relationship with God if you don't have good relationships with one another. But why is it we struggle with those so often? We don't have problems with it. We don't have problems with ourselves, do we? We got it figured out. It has to be somebody else who's causing me this uneasiness. This last half, uh, this last half of chapter four finds itself in context. This is just a footnote. Finds itself in context right after the beginning of John chapter four. We'll not uh, parse that beginning out. But it's interesting because in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And it builds this, uh, it builds this Christ and Antichrist, truth and lie theme, good and bad, good and evil. So it's against that entry point that this scripture comes forward, almost to say, check your lives to see carefully who you're serving. And then there's this body of what love is all about through Christ with one another. And then as we look at that, how do we understand our relationship with God? Well, we must move quickly. We're going to cover one more chapter in three minutes or less. Pete, set your timer. So what is love anyway? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we have a description there. For I love pizza, I love beautiful sunsets, I love my wife. But what are the characteristics and attributes that really describe love? In our call to worship, verse 4, John chapter 13, how many of these attributes are found in your life? Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomely. It does not seek out its own, it's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth. All of the things that love is not, and moving to those that are, uh, that are love. Love bears all things, believe all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And chapter 13 says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is what? Is love. So, during this season of year, we have to ask ourselves, how are we doing with our love for God? Are we patient? Are we kind? Are we representing God to a perishing world in our homes, on the work site, in our relationships with one another, in such a way that Christ is revealed in every exchange? Let me take you for two minutes to one more chapter. I'd invite you this afternoon, I'd challenge you, I'd encourage you, if I could, I'd mandate 
that for the next 31 days you would read two chapters of the Bible. And here's why. That you would read John, 1 John chapter 4, the passages we have just read, and you'd read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 every day for 31 days. And then I would challenge you to come back, come back and have a conversation with me. And it would go something like this. Pastor, you wasted my time. It doesn't work. Or let me know how you've been blessed. Because it is by allowing the, the scriptures to come into our hearts and into our lives that our lives are subtly, strangely, mysteriously transformed. So that which is cold and indifferent becomes warm and pleasing. That which we harbor hard feelings for is forgiven when we behold Christ forgiving our sins. That which the stranger is longing for a relationship, we become a friend instead of being distant. I'm so glad that the scripture gives us experiences and gives us illustrations in very tangible human ways with flesh on them. So that this thing called religion isn't something just ethereal and abstract, but it's real, just as certain as the air you breathe today, friends. And it will fill your life. It will open your heart and fill your soul in ways that you can't absorb enough of if we will just abide in his presence. So I want to go to one story for two minutes today. You can read the story in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. From Desire of Ages, I want to read you the start of that chapter. It says, in the story of the Good Samaritan. Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds, or rites. Did you catch that? Not in systems, not in creeds, not in rites, but in the performance of loving deeds in bringing the greatest good to others in genuine goodness. So if I understand that correctly, sometimes as groups, people groups, and sometimes as organizations, we want to do things, we want to do things in an efficient and an effective way. So we get together and we say, what do we believe corporately anyway? Well, we believe this. And you should never do this. And you should always do this. And if you always do this, then you're in. And if you're doing that, you're not so in. And if you're kind of like us, maybe we'll have lunch with you. And if you're kind of not like us, well, you can swim by yourself. We would never do that intentionally, would we? Human nature, what it is, it says he shows that it consists not in systems, not in creeds or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds in bringing the greatest good to others in genuine godliness or goodness. So it's not creeds, it doesn't, the hierarchy is not creeds, performance, and then Christ. No, it's turned around. It's Christ and God first, then our relationship and behavior one to another, and then creeds and efficiencies of organizations last. Did you catch that? Now, I want to be very clear. Is it scriptural? <laughs> I got one yes. <laughs> Is it scriptural? Okay. People first then beliefs and systems, and then creeds. But the easiest thing in human nature is to put the creeds first and people down here somewhere. So let's take the next minute and a half and look at Luke chapter 10 just for a minute. We find there a story as Christ was teaching, a certain lawyer stood up and said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life. 
With breathless attention, the large congregation awaited the answer. And the lawyer said, which of the commandments are most important? Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two hang all of the law and prophets. And Jesus answered, you've answered your own question well. And the lawyer found himself speechless as Jesus answered that question in summary fashion. However, he didn't stop there. He told them the story because among the Jews, this question, he said, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Because among the Jews, the Jews were, neighbor to one, were neighbors of each other. But to those who were not Jews, the Jews would have no dealings with the heathen or the Samaritans. They were strangers and enemies. And there was a distinction made between nations. Who should the priest or rabbi or elder regard as his neighbor, her neighbor? Were they to regard the unclean as neighbors? That was the essence of the proposition. And Jesus told the story. He told the story of a certain man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho. And you know the story as well as I do. And he fell among robbers, which stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest came by and saw the man off in the distance. He was in a hurry. And so he passed by on one side, in like manner, a Levite. Also, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. Neither wanted anything to do with him. This was no imaginary scene, but a natural occurrence, which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed on either side were in the company that listened to Christ's words. In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveler had to pass through that portion of the wilderness in Judea. And as he walked through the wilds, he was attacked and victimized. It wasn't until one who was considered an, out an outcast came by. We call him the Good Samaritan. Looked upon the man covered with just a blanket, bent over, gave him, of some, gave him of some bread and some oil, and ministered to him there, gathered him up in his arms, put him on his donkey, carried him or led the donkey to what would be an inn, paid for the night's lodging and said anything else he needs, Give him, and then when I return, I will cover the rest. An amazing, incredible story, isn't it? It's kind of like when you pull off I-5, and you see that person there. We'll work for food. He's been there every day for two weeks, and you wonder why he's still there if he's willing to work for food. And you have a certain amount of desensitization. I'll just drive by. And so you do. Or that person that just doesn't look like you, dress like you, smell like you, think like you, they must not be a person of your character. But the Good Samaritan saw the man in need and realized he was an agent of God, picked him up, cared for him, and loved him. In stark contrast to the priests who gladly would have pulled a lamb out of the ditch or an ox out of the ditch, they left the human right there beside the road. The provisions of the law were clear. Help those in need. The question, who is my neighbor, is forever answered. Christ has shown that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. Desire of Ages says very clearly, it has no reference to race color, class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded, 
bruised, and battered by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God, to which we can say what? To which we can say what? Amen? Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Our neighbor is you, friends. Our neighbor is the one sitting next to you. Our neighbor is your neighbor at home. Your neighbor is somebody at work. They are the property of God, and we need to reach them with the gospel. That chapter closes with a challenge. You see, we can profess to love God, but profession is not enough unless we live out that profession. Desire of Ages closes the chapter with a challenge. All this is but a fulfillment to the principle of the law. The principle is illustrated in the story of the Good Samaritan and made manifest in the life of Christ. His character reveals the true significance of the law and shows what is meant by loving our neighbor as ourselves. And when the children of God manifest mercy and kindness and love towards all men, they also are witnessing to the character and the statutes of heaven. They are bearing testimony to the fact that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Want to testify about the goodness of God today? Let that love flow through you, and whoever fails to manifest this love is breaking the law which he professes to revere. For the spirit we manifest toward our brother, brethren declares our spirit toward God. Listen carefully to the love of God in the heart. The love of God in the heart is the only spring of love toward our neighbor. Did you catch that? The love of God in the heart is the only spring of love toward our neighbor. And then she quotes 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 12. If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he have not seen? Beloved, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us. His love is perfected in us. We abide in his love as we love one another with audacious love that he loves us with, so we ought to love one another. Let us pray. Father, as we have spent time with you today, we realize in the quietness of this sanctuary there are times and spaces and voids in our life. There are places of emptiness where we've walked on our own. And Lord, we come to you today. We come humbly to the foot of Jesus today and ask, Lord, for that forgiveness. We ask for that cleansing. We ask, Lord, that you will cast out of our hearts, cast out of our minds, those things that we hold indifferent, those things that are barriers towards others that we intentionally, unintentionally harbor. Father, abide with us. You've shown your heavenly, audacious love to us. You've shown your mercy and your grace. You've called us while we were yet sinners. You have filled our lives with your spirit. So, Father, may we take that audacious love to each person that we come in contact with, that their hearts and their lives might be filled with goodness and grace. As, Father, we share it with them, we draw closer to you. 
Bless us, Father, to that end, that your love might be perfected in us. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.